Well, happy Easter. Welcome to Grace Fellowship. If you're a guest of ours, we're glad you're here. Why don't you stand with us? Let's celebrate our risen Savior this morning. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he.
That's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. Oh, 
Aren't you glad we serve a risen Savior? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather on this blessed Easter Sunday, we're so grateful that you overcame. You gave us victory through the cross. Lord, we come before you in humility and grace. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate today. And as we have pleaded the blood of Jesus over our lives and declared victory over our trials, let us transition our hearts and our minds to receive your word, Jesus. Lord, open our ears and soften our hearts. And may the message plant seeds of faith, hope and love that flourish in our lives. Lord, help us to understand the depth of your love and the power of the resurrection. May we leave here today transformed, ready to live out the gospel in every word we speak and every action we take. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated.
It's that time of the season. It's wedding season. Studies show that April through October is the most popular of time for weddings to occur. I bet right now you probably have a wedding invitation magneted to your refrigerator. If the bride chose to send it out electronically, it may be in your phone. You know, depending upon who's getting married dictates your level of enthusiasm about being invited to the wedding. You know, weddings cost money. It seems like you're always having to buy a fresh shirt or maybe some new shoes or a tie to go to the wedding. But especially if you're in the wedding, it costs money. Bridesmaids have to buy dresses. Groomsmen have to rent tuxedos. I remember, I remember when my daughter was a little bit younger, she had a group of girls over. And hearing this one particular girl say, I can't afford another wedding uh, bridesmaid dress. This is my third wedding in two months. So for her... Being part of the wedding was a burden because of the bridesmaid dress she had to buy. I always remember this. So when my daughter was getting married, I told Joe, my wife, I said, I want to pay for everything. I don't want anyone to be out of any expense coming to our wedding. We're going to pay for the hotel rooms. We're going to buy the bridesmaid dresses. We're going to pay for everything. As we got deeper and deeper into the wedding, I asked my daughter, I said, do you think your friends could pay for their own bridesmaids dresses? <laughs> and realize how expensive this gets. You know, Jesus knew that people remember stories more than they remember facts. And because of that, Jesus Christ told a story about a wedding. It's found in the book of Matthew. All the scriptures will be on the slide screen. If you brought your Bible with you, you're welcome to follow along. It'll be in Matthew chapter 22. And it goes like this. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven... It's like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who'd been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused. Again, he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who've been invited that I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field and another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and actually killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go out to the street corners and invite everyone to the banquet, anyone you can find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. When Jesus Christ told parables, it obviously had characters in it. The characters in the parables were symbolism of real people, pointing to real people. In this particular parable, here's what the characters in the parable represent. The king represents God. The son who represents Jesus. The servants represents the prophets, the messengers who came ahead, the servants, to tell the world about Jesus. The original invitees, those who were invited first but turned down, were the Jews. Then the open invitation was to the rest of the world, to people like you and I, the world, to come to it. The meaning of this parable is it's a foretelling of the future, that when Christians will be reunited with Christ in heaven, or if he returns before we pass away, that we will be reunited with Christ. The Bible refers to Jesus as the groom, and it refers to the body of believers, commonly referred to as the church, as to the bride. And we will one day be joined together with our groom, Jesus Christ. It also points out, this parable points out to us, that salvation was offered to everyone. Back during that time, if a young man wanted to marry a young woman, the family, the parents of the young man, would pay a dowry to the parents of the bride for the right 
to claim that uh, young woman, to ask that young woman to be the bride. And so what God has done for us is he has paid the penalty, he has paid the dowry, the right, for we to be wed to Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ to call us our own. It came first to the Jews, and then it came to the rest of the world. Everyone has been invited, has had their dowry paid by God. But notice that none were good enough to come to the wedding. It says first when when the Jews were invited, it says, but they were not deserving, that they were not worthy. Even though they thought they were, even though they could quote a lot of scripture and so forth, the Bible says that they were not worthy. But then it says that when God sent his servants out to the highways and byways to invite anyone to come to the wedding with a king to come, that they invited both the good and the bad. The point is this, is that no one could come to the wedding Unless they were invited, much like today. No one is supposed to come to a wedding unless they're invited. Even if you consider yourself really good and a friend of it, if you didn't get that invitation, you're not invited to the wedding. Notice that there were multiple invitations. So the first time when the king sent out the invitations, he sent out twice to the Jews. And they rejected each time. And then he sent out the invitation to the rest of the world. And God says, tell everyone, the king said, tell everyone that, that I've, I've killed my fattened calf. I've, I've killed my oxen. The banquet's ready. The feast is ready. I really want them to come. But they all refused. They had a choice whether to accept the invitation or not. Some made excuses like you and I can make excuses today. They said, you know what? I've got to get back to my business. Some said, I've got to get back to my field. Some said, I've got to go back home and take care of my family. So in other words, your wedding invitation is not important enough to me right now. Amazingly or not, according to this parable, it says that some got so angry that they killed the servants who were bringing the invitation. Can you imagine someone getting so mad that they kill a messenger bringing an invitation to a wedding? And we see that today. That at the mere mention of the name Jesus, who represents love and forgiveness, how angry the world gets at just us simply sharing the message of Jesus' love with them. But we see in this parable that the king got angry when they rejected his invitation. And it says that he sent more of his servants out to destroy their cities and kill them. And it's a reminder to us today that when we reject God's invitation to us to come to him, that God does not just simply sit idly by when we reject him. Sometimes in order to get our attention, God destroys things in our life that mean the most to us. He allows us to hold on to them ourselves, which often means we're going to break them sooner or later. But God knows that it's oftentimes through these difficult times, these brokenness, that we do pay attention to the invitation that comes. Notice that when this had taken place and many of the people came and the wedding banquet was hall, the king comes into the wedding banquet and he surveys everyone there. And you know his heart has to be warmed, has to be full of joy seeing how many people did accept the invitation to his son's wedding. But he looks down at this particular man who's not wearing wedding clothes. And he says, how did you get in here without the wedding clothes? And he becomes extremely angry. And when we first read that, we wonder, why is is he so angry? He was so desperate for people to come to his son's wedding. He should be thrilled that everyone came regardless of how they looked. But if you know the history, the customs of that time, is that if you invited someone to a wedding and you expected them to dress a certain way, the way our invitations go out with expected dress attire, the king, being the wealthiest, most powerful person, would know that no one had the wealth that he had, that no one could afford the type of clothing that he had. So the king would send out the wedding clothing that he wanted people to wear to the wedding. And when people got their package, 
in the mail today or back then by servants. When they got their package and they opened up, they knew immediately, this is what I'm expected to wear to the wedding. And one man took a look at it and said, ah, you know, I don't think I feel like wearing this. Can you imagine inviting someone to your wedding, especially if they were in your wedding? Let's say you have all the bridesmaids wearing red dresses. And, and someone in your bridesmaid court shows up in shorts and a t-shirt. Your, your first question would be, did you not get the dress I sent you? Why aren't you in the dress I sent you? I'm sure the man who had not dressed appropriately had rehearsed over and over in his head the reasons he was going to give for not wearing the wedding clothes. I just don't feel like it. You know, I'm kind of tired of dressing up. I like my favorite t-shirt. He had everything reversed in rehearsed in his head, and so the king says, how did you get in here without clothes on? The same question you would ask your bridesmaid. How did you show up without a dress? I'm not allowing you to be in the pictures. You're going to ruin everything. For years to come, people are going to look at the pictures and say, who's this in the shorts and T-shirts? How come you let them in the picture? When the man was asked, How'd you get in here without your wedding clothes? He was speechless. Everything he had re rehearsed in his head that he would say, he was speechless. You see, it wasn't desperation why the king wanted so many people at his son's wedding. It was desire that he wanted them at his wedding that they would come celebrate and rejoice the joyous occasion of being a part of his son's wedding. And because of that, because of that desire, he invited everyone. But he did not lower the standard that was required to get into the wedding. How this applies to us today, how this applies to salvation today, is that God has invited us to a wedding to be joined together with Jesus Christ, our groom and us as his bride. The required wedding clothes for us to get into the wedding, to be included in the wedding, is a robe of righteousness. The word righteousness means to be without sin, to be forgiven of the sins we've done, to be as pure as we can be, never having done anything wrong. We know it is impossible for us to do that. We know of our sin nature. Even when we try to our best to do nothing wrong, we continue to sin, and that doesn't include all, of course, the sins of our past. Our king, God, knows that we didn't have the right clothing to get into the wedding. So he sent to us, through his son, Jesus Christ, a robe of righteousness. Forgiveness of our sins was sent to us. God sent to us the clothing that we could not afford because he didn't want us to be burdened with the cost, but simply to focus on the joy of being a part of the wedding. And just like that person in the parable, we have a choice to make. Will we accept this robe of righteousness, this forgiveness of our sins that's been given to us, or will we reject it? But no matter how much, and it's a lot, that God desires that we be a part of the wedding, that we be forgiven of our sins, that we have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, as much as God desires that for us and as much as he loves you and I, he hasn't lowered his standard. He said the standard to come to the wedding, to be invited in and able to stay, is that robe of righteousness that only comes through the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus Christ. The normal question to ask would be, well, how do we get an invitation to the wedding? And how do we get these clothes of righteousness? The Bible tells us that God has extended the invitation to everyone. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God says, This is how much I love you. This is how much I desire for you to come and be joined together with me through my son, Jesus Christ. He said, I'm giving my son, Jesus, to die on a cross 
for your sins. And this is what the Bible says about him dying on the cross. It says, He, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And what that is simply saying is that when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, and by the way, he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross, that every one of our sins, our past, our present, and our future were nailed with him. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's the price that has to be paid. And Jesus Christ said that no one takes my life from me. I willingly give my life. So he laid there on that wooden cross with his arms outstretched and his feet still so that they could get the nail in the right place. The Bible says that the punishment that we are due was laid upon him. We all deserve a punishment what we've done when we look over our lives. We all have betrayed God. We all have at times cursed God and blamed him for that. Even though he's perfect and given us everything we have. But it says that our punishment was laid upon him. He takes the beating for us. And it says by his stripes we are healed. Those stripes means by the, by the cuts that the whip made when it was being lashed against his back by his By his lashes, by his wounds, we are healed. Healed of what? Well, we are healed of a sickness that we all have called sin. When God created the world, it was a perfect place. You've heard the story of Adam and Eve. But they sinned. They didn't like God's advice. And so they took matters in their own hand. And when that happened, the earth fell. We have a fallen world. Sin entered the world. And every person who's been born after that inherited a sin nature. That's why we so easily do what we do when we sin. But we have been healed of that sickness of sin. We've been forgiven of those sins through Jesus Christ. I've got a picture someone made here, what he may have looked like on the cross. He looks so helpless hanging there, doesn't he? But that's just it. He's not helpless. Oh, they tried to get him to come down by mocking. They said, oh, you claim that you came to save us? Save yourself. You claim that you were the son of God? Then get yourself down from there. But even though they mocked him, even though they taunted him and said, come on down and show us that you can come down, and he could. He was powerful enough. He wasn't helpless. He said, I'm staying here. Till all the sin of the world is laid upon him. He didn't say a thing. He didn't didn't protest that this is unfair. He didn't say what we oftentimes say. I did nothing wrong. In fact, the Bible says this this is how he responded. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears are silent... So he did not open his mouth because he came with a purpose. He did eventually say something right before it was over and he gave up his life. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. How many times have we blamed God? How many times have we cursed God? At God. How many times have we said, This is your fault, God? And through all of that, the forgiveness of Christ still reigns. And He still says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are saying, they don't understand your true character, God. That forgiveness is still extended to us today. He gave up His life. They put him in a tomb, counted him among the dead. But he didn't stay there. And that's why we're here today. That's what we celebrate today. He came back to life. In fact, the Bible says that God raised him from the dead. And why that's important 
is because it was demonstrating his power over death. That when we accept Jesus Christ in our heart and Lord and Savior, because he rose from the dead, so too we will rise from the dead whenever we die on this earth to have eternal life with him. He demonstrated his power over the consequences of sin, not just death, but the fallen world. That's why Jesus Christ can make this promise to all of us. In this world, you will have trials and you will have tribulations. You're going to have difficult times, horrible managers, bad relationships, bad jobs, financial problems. That's our trials and tribulations, sicknesses. And Jesus Christ says, but take heart, have courage, for I have overcome the world. The world wasn't supposed to be like this when God created, but when sin came in, we well know it's like this. And Jesus Christ said, you don't have to live in fear and weakness when you accept me because I'm stronger than the world. And you and I together, Jesus speaking, can overcome this world. To get this robe of righteousness... There's something that we have to do, just like accepting that invitation of clothing that was sent in the mail back then. We, too, have something that we have to do to get this robe of righteousness. The Bible says it's this. This righteousness, this robe of righteousness, is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's given. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough. We're all undeserving. We're all too poor to afford it. And our good deeds fall flat when compared to the expense of that robe. We just simply have to believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins. Acknowledge that we're all sinners. That shouldn't be hard to do. And say, Lord, I need your help. When I look over my life when I was a younger man, had problems, many problems before I accepted Christ. I would get mad at those problems. Yeah, I would say things to God. I'd get mad at other people. But when I was honest with myself and I looked back over my life, I realized something. There was one common denominator in all my problems. That common denominator was me. Wherever I was, where, who I was around, whatever I was doing, it was me that was there. I was poor. And every one of us who've accepted Christ, to realize how poor we are before him. But when you accept that free gift, this is how you feel. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding and a bribe adorned with her jewels. And it's given to us freely. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Because if we were earning it, if we were working hard to get it, because of our sin nature, we'd be boasting about how much that we deserve it. And God has reminded us, you don't deserve it. I'm giving it to you because of my love for you. The Bible goes on to say that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Why that's important is because we all think, well, if I do accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'm not sure if I'm strong enough to give up. And you can fill in the blank of what you need to give up. The improper relationship, the illicit use of alcohol, excessive use of it, of drugs, the lying, the cheating, the judging of others, the gossiping, the list goes on and on. You can fill in the blank. And that's why his forgiveness never ends. Because he knows that we're going to continue to sin. But while we're filled with joy, it's because every time we sin, the Bible says that he is faithful to forgive us. People, people make excuses. I've got, I've got a lot of work to do. And they say things like this. As soon as I get my job and my career right, I'm going to get my life right with God. As soon as I find the person I love and get married and then we'll have kids and everything, as soon as I get all that right, then, then we're really going to start going to church because I'll start going to church once I get married. As, as soon as I get all this debt paid off and I focus on that, then, then I'm going to be more committed to God. They make those excuses, just like they did in that parable. And this is what Jesus said to them. He said this. He said that, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If, if, if your excitement 
about Jesus Christ is hoping that he'll advance your career, hoping that he'll help you find the right spouse, hoping that he'll get you out of debt, hoping for all these things. If, if that's what excites you about Jesus, let me tell you something. He can do it. He is greater than everything in this earth. He has overcome it. The Bible says this, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus Christ said this, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed in him, that you can say to this mountain, move from here and move from there. Jesus Christ said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. If that's your criteria for accepting Christ, that you be more successful in all areas of life, he can do it. But he says, if that's your criteria, you're missing the point. Because those things fade away. He said, but if you put me first in your life and realize that we need forgiveness of our sins, if you start making me a priority about how you speak to others, about how you conduct yourself, he said, I'll take care of all the other things that you need. But I can tell you this, when you do give your life to Christ, it won't be because you think he's going to make you more successful or solve all your problems. It will be because you're broken. Because when we try to control everything ourselves and do it, we're not good about keeping things together for a long time. The world betrays us. People betray us. We mess up, and we end up with a mess in our life. It's then when we start thinking about that invitation that God has sent us through Jesus. It's then we realize and we need more than just a better career, a better relationship, or better money. We need someone more powerful in our lives. We need forgiveness in our life. And it's then when we start caring about what God has offered to us through Jesus Christ. My wife is executive director of a pro-life ministry, saving uh, unborn children, helping women who find themselves in unplanned pregnancy. God has tremendously blessed that ministry. She speaks to larger crowds than I do. She gets invited to more things than I do. Some people consider her kind of important here in Central Texas, far more than me. Because of that, she gets invited to a lot of events. One of the events is called the Rally for Life. It's a pro-life rally that occurs once a year in downtown Austin. 10,000 people normally attend it. They come from all over Texas there. They build a stage, a platform down at the Capitol, and the guest speaker obviously speaks from the platform, but they allow other people to be on the stage with them. This particular year, Governor Greg Abbott was the keynote speaker. And, of course, Joe was invited, and all I have to do is just be her husband and show up. So we show up to the Capitol, and there's all these tourists down there. And they're all kind of milling around. And I kind of feel a little bit more important than the tourists because I'm there to be on stage with Governor Greg Abbott. I see the state trooper there. I always get confused when I'm at the Capitol of what exit to take to get to the stage. So I go up to this state trooper, and I ask him, I say, excuse me, sir. Uh, my wife's supposed to be on stage with uh, Governor Abbott. Can you tell me which door I go through? And he pointed to it. I said, thank you. I was rehearsing through my head what I was going to say to Greg Abbott. I'm going to be right there next to him. Is it appropriate to get a selfie with him or not? <laughs> you don't want to touch his wheelchair. That's his personal space and everything. I'm thinking all this in my head. And I look over to this corner, and I see this guy who looks different than the state trooper I spoke with. I've got a picture of what it kind of looks like up there. He had on the night vision goggles. He had a very large, what looked like a sniper rifle with him. He was in military fatigues. He was dressed just like that. And I thought to myself, what's he doing inside the Capitol? Shouldn't he be on a roof somewhere? I looked away for a split second. And I felt this presence in front of me. And he, along with many others, as big as him, as intimidating him, were right in front of me. And I looked down at my feet, and there is Governor Greg Abbott rolling by in his wheelchair. But it seemed like it was slow motion. And he looked right up at me like he hadn't looked at anyone else. He looked right up at me and he says, how's it going? <laughs> All I could say was, 
Yes, sir. <laughs> and he was gone. He never slowed down. And, and I thought to myself, should I chase after him? I said, no, those people aren't going to let me get next to him. Everything that I had rehearsed to say to Governor Abbott fell flat. And I didn't have anything to say in that presence that he appeared so quickly. Joe and I were not on stage with Governor Abbott that year. They were doing construction at the Capitol. They had a much smaller stage. Um, in layman's terms, we weren't important enough to make the small stage. There. <laughs> Many people think that when they get to heaven, that they're going to sit down with Jesus and just have a long talk with Jesus. You know, I've haven't accepted Jesus Christ as my heart's Lord and Savior. But Jesus and I have an agreement that when we get together, we're going to talk about, you know, the hand of cards that he dealt me, you know, what he's done and has done in my life. And, um, and we're just going to have a long talk about it. That's not what the Bible says. Everything that you have rehearsed in your mind that you're going to say to Jesus when you get into his presence is not going to come out of your mouth. You're going to be in such awe. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ appears, that not now, is that when Jesus Christ appears, is that he has a host, i.e. army, of angels with him. And they aren't like the angels that our kids are drawing right now in children's church. They're warring angels, military angels, who have been fighting the spiritual battle on our behalf. And when Jesus Christ appears with his host, his army of angels, we are going to be so intimidated and awestruck about him, we're not going to be saying anything. Well, actually, we will say something. After our knee hits the dirt and our mouths open, the Bible says that everyone will profess Jesus Christ is Lord. All we will be able to say is, you are Lord, you are Lord, you are Lord, over and over again. Is that? In his presence. And for those who have not accepted the invitation and put on the robe of righteousness, allowed him to forgive you of your sins, this is what the Bible says it's going to look like for them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I, Jesus speaking, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In layman's terms, in modern terms, people will say, I went to church often. I actually had my wedding in a church. I gave money to church and to the poor. I occasionally said some prayers. I talked about you. And Jesus says, I am going to say to you on that day, who have rejected me through life, I am going to say to you on that day, away from me, you evildoer, for I never knew you. Jesus Christ said this about the religious people at that time. They honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. And it's our heart that drives us to be obedient to Christ and to live a life according to his word. And when we don't, then we're not forgiven of our sins if we have rejected him. Can I tell you that is not what God wants. He does not want you to experience that. That's why he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to be nailed to that cross, to have all of our sins put on him so that we can be forgiven, to have the burden of guilt removed from us and have eternal life with him. There's a painting called First Day in Heaven. I've got it up here. Such a heartwarming painting of the joy that it will be. And I want you to compare the joy that you see in that painting compared to the heartbreak in that scripture we just read. 
This is what God wants you to experience at the wedding feast with his son. We're not just invited to the wedding. Get this. We are in the wedding. We are the bride of Christ. And what he wants you to hear is this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and receive all that's been prepared for you. That's the message of the cross and the empty tomb. That's the invitation that God's extending to us. It is, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your heart's Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit is moving in you saying, God's speaking to you right now. It is wedding season for you today. Will you accept the invitation and put on that robe of righteousness? If you haven't, this is our time of invitation where you can come forward and surrender your life to him. Let's go to him in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, God. As interesting as it is to hear these parables and stories that you tell, Jesus, it is even more serious about the truth that they are conveying to us. I pray, Lord, as you desire that anyone here who doesn't know your son, Jesus Christ, as their personal Lord and Savior, would indeed today surrender their life to you. To say, I'm not good enough. I keep messing up. I need you, Jesus, in my life to forgive me of my sins and make things right. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may come forward at this time if the Holy Spirit's moving you to surrender your life to Christ. If you're in need of prayer, myself and several other of our staff will be up here. Glad to pray with you. Even if you're a Christian, just struggling, need some encouragement. If by chance you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you here. But that's small. That's small compared to forgiveness of your sins and relationship with Christ. We can, we can talk about that too. But let's not lose sight of what today is about. Eternal life with Christ. All stand, please. to go.
we just pray and thank you for all that you've done that you went on the cross for us you thought of us your children that you are worthy Jesus to be praised we thank you for your sacrifice we thank you that you've risen that you are alive in us we serve a risen savior And God, as we transition now into this time of offering, Lord, let it be an act of worship that we give back a portion of which you've given us to further your kingdom. Continue to move among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Good morning. Uh, I am Pastor Joshua. I have been running around like crazy in the back. Uh, getting things ready. I've learned a few years ago that suit and ties do not work well with outdoors in Texas. Amen. Uh, not good. Uh, if you are a visitor with us, um, we want you to know that we are excited that you are here with us at Grace Fellowship Church. Um, I pray that you experience Christ as you walk through the doors and just experience his love here with you, with us today, uh, through worship and word. Uh, When you came in this morning, you should have received a church bulletin. Uh, Inside that bulletin has several announcements of events that are coming up. So you can look through those. I wanted to share a few that are not on there because we actually have a lot that goes on and it does not fit all on paper. Um, But we, our men's ministry meets once a month, second Saturdays. We do breakfast and kolaches and word uh, back there. Our ladies go out to dinner once a month as well as Bible studies that are going on. If you need a place to plug into a church, please feel free to get with myself or Pastor Mark uh, this morning. We would love to connect with you, love to meet you, and just kind of share uh, our heart with this community and our purpose here as Grace Fellowship Church to really love one another, be a family, and reach this community for uh, people who are lost, who need Jesus. Um, I always end every service uh, with that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. He, we are uh, called in the word of God ambassadors, and uh, we should be the light to a dying, hopeless world around us. You have a hope inside of you, Jesus Christ, who gives you a peace that passes all understanding, uh, a love and a joy that, they do not, that other people do not get to experience who do not know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Uh, especially during this time, but each and every day, see opportunities to reach other people for Christ. We are a ministry about discipling, building people who love Jesus, and getting those people reaching others to love Jesus and getting them involved as well. Thank you for being here this week. Just one deal. We have uh, bounce houses for kiddos, um, adults. I'm sorry. We don't don't have adult bounce houses. You, You will be kicked off the bounce houses. But For our kiddos, uh, the ones who are not crawling, barely crawling, pre-K and under. So we have two Easter egg hunts. Uh, One is in our playground. So when you go out the sanctuary, you'll make a right and then immediate left uh, down the stairs or the ramp. But there are double doors that open up to the back, uh, the church back here. On the left side is our playground for our littles. Easter egg hunt, there'll be a couple of ladies there uh, kind of holding everybody off till we start. For our older kids, y'all guys will go right. And we have a very large pasture that's kind of mowed and pretty and cut and you cannot miss the 1200 something or so eggs that are all over the ground out there you know this morning is about really honoring Jesus and just rejoicing that he is alive you know no other religion can do that to say that uh, our, our God is no longer there he is seated at the right hand of the father and we are eagerly waiting his return uh, so one little deal This is a gold Easter egg. We have several of these out there in both Easter egg hunts. Um, 
you may shake it and your kid may go, look, mom and dad, they, 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 they ruined it. There's nothing inside this one. They got me. But these eggs actually uh, return for prizes. There are tables out there with cookies, lemonade, water. We'll have some music going and stuff. Please stay, fellowship, um, enjoy the morning. But if you find an Easter egg hunt, kiddos, and parents, the ones who are back there and children, they will not know this, so let them know. They find an empty gold Easter egg. There is a table with a bunch of prizes out there. They can return the gold Easter egg for a price. Amen. God bless y'all. Have a great week. Thank you for being here. We hope that y'all join us next week.